One thing God had me do was assign a name. He gave me a, I took this pad of paper and just started naming each baby that I aborted. And I'm not sure why or I had to just name each one, each as I thought of each one, I named them. And that seemed to bring him. Claire Colwell and Josiah Presley, thanks for being here. Thanks so much for having us. So I've gotten to talk with you guys before. Can you tell me how you first got connected to abortion? I met my birth mother in 2009, and I thanked her for choosing life for me. I was so grateful for the life and the family that she had given me. And to my surprise, she broke down into tears and told me that she did it. She actually had an abortion while she was pregnant with me, and they accidentally missed my body during the abortion that successfully aborted my twin. And it was the most shocking moment of my life, most shocking news of my life, to find out that I survived something that was meant to end it. What about you, Josiah? Yeah, so uh, I grew up in a very Christian home, actually. Um, I'm one of 12 kids, 10 of us are being adopted. And uh, my adopted parents, when I was 13 years old, uh, they thought I was old enough to know more about my adoption story and the circumstances that led up to it. And they told me um, about how my birth mother, actually uh, two months in her pregnancy with me in South Korea, uh, had had a DNC abortion. And so uh, I found that out when I was 13, uh, growing up in a very uh, Christian home, very pro-life home, uh, we understood that abortion was wrong. And so it was, it was quite a shock for me to take in at that time. And uh, it did take a number of years just as um, I struggled with that, uh, dealing with the reality of that portion of my story. And then uh, as I came to faith later on in high school, uh, the Lord was able to redeem that back in my life. And then uh, I've just been kind of sharing my story and being able to work with groups since then. And so uh, it's been a real blessing uh, to see the Lord uh, work and, and use that. Josiah, you mentioned that it you discovered at age 13 that they attempted mm -hmm. a DNC abortion on you. Yeah. What is a DNC abortion? So it's the type of abortion where the doctor, uh, to my understanding, basically goes into the mother's womb and uh, rips the baby apart and brings them out in pieces. And did they share any more details about why that abortion has failed and how that affected you? Yeah, so uh, so it's really interesting. Um, in, so in my story, uh, my parents really just have this one report um, that they actually, uh, when they're going through the adoption process of adopting me, it, it was just kind of tucked away in all the paperwork. Um, and so, so there's really not a ton of information on it. Uh, we know that, um, According to the report at the time, my birth parents, uh, they were they were living together unmarried, that they had a, a four-year-old daughter at the time, and, and that due to financial difficulties, they decided to have, uh, have that abortion done. Um, one thing that we've speculated at and, and have just wondered through the years as um, as I've kind of wrestled with the story um, was, you know, we've wondered if my deformed arm is a, is a direct um, result of that abortion. Uh, we also wonder if uh, maybe I had a twin with me in my mother's womb um, that they didn't realize. And they, uh, at the time, you know, brought one baby out, not realizing there was a second and uh, thinking that the abortion was incomplete. Uh, we're, we're not entirely positive uh, on all those facts, um, but that's something we speculated, something we've uh, thought about and wrestled with uh, mm -hmm. over the years. But when your birth parents found out that they were still, your birth mother was still pregnant even after the abortion had been completed. She chose to continue the pregnancy at that point. Do you have any details on that? Yeah, so um, at two months, she decided to have uh, the abortion. And that six months, she realized that I was still very much so alive. Um, and at that point, uh, they kept me and I, and I was uh, brought to term and born later. Um, and then I was placed with a, a foster home agency in South Korea. And I lived with a foster family uh, for about 13 months before I was adopted and brought over to the States. Claire, do you know what kind of abortion was used on your twin? I believe it was the same type of abortion. Uh, um, D and E is what I was told. Is that the... It's a later type? abortion. Yeah. So my birth mother had a D and E abortion because her abortion was around five months along. Oof. So even later than Josiah's abortion attempt. 
And so my understanding is it's similar where it um, tears the baby's body apart limb by limb. So today we have with us your two abortion survivors and we have three former abortionists who have shared their stories very vocally about being involved in abortion in the past. And I want to have a conversation between all of us here. You just heard Dr. Levitino, Josiah, describe a DNC abortion. Um, how would you describe a DNC abortion? A DN, suction DNC abortion is done in the first 13 weeks since last menstrual period, basically the first trimester of pregnancy. DNC stands for dilatation or dilation and curatage. Curatage is a scraping of the uterus with a specific instrument. The cervix is dilated or open, and a suction catheter is placed inside the endometrial cavity where the baby and the product, quote, products of conception are. Um, a suction is applied, usually using a machine, sometimes a syringe, but the machine works best. It's a very powerful suction. And the for people to get an idea of what we're talking about, look at the width of your hand. From The width of your hand is a 12-week baby, head to rump, not counting the legs. So we're talking about a baby that size or smaller. And the suction is powerful enough to literally dismember the child, tear it into pieces. And they come through the suction tubing, and then a curatage or a scraping of the lining of the uterus is done with an instrument to make sure all the pieces are removed. When the, when the procedure is done, the abortionist needs to open the machine and basically do inventory, make sure they got two arms, two legs, and all the pieces. It's a very important part of the procedure. And Claire just described briefly a D&E abortion, which was what was performed on her twin. Did that sound like an accurate description, or how would you describe a D&E abortion? A D&E abortion is very much a cut above, uh, because now you're talking about abortions that begin where suction DNC leaves off at about 13 weeks of gestation and can be used typically up to 24 weeks. There are a few practitioners doing them beyond, but usually we talk about these procedures being done up to 24 weeks. Um, I always tell people, you know, imagine that, you know, your, your patient is 20 weeks pregnant. Her uterus is all the way up to her umbilicus. She's been feeling the baby kick. Um, as I said, a 12-week baby is the width of your hand. A 20-week baby is the length of your hand. From the tip of your middle finger to the wrist, that's a 20-week baby not counting the legs. Um, and again, a suction is used. A suction catheter is used. This is a 14 French suction catheter. And in a DNC abortion, you pretty much do the whole abortion, most of it, with this one instrument. When babies are this big, they don't fit through catheters this size. So mainly the suction is used in this case to remove the amniotic fluid that's surrounding the baby that was there to protect the baby. When the suction is done and that fluid has been removed, then you again have to dismember the baby, but we're talking about a much bigger human being. Uh, and you use a device called a sofa clamp. The business end is about two and a half inches long and a half inch wide. And if you could see this, there are rows of sharp teeth. This is a grasping instrument. When it gets a hold of something, it does not let go. Um, the way I used to do DNA abortions, I didn't bother using ultrasound, frankly, it just slowed things down. And you have to reach in with the clamp and then blindly grab anything you can. And as I try to explain to people, I mean, picture what this is like, putting this instrument in and then pulling, and I mean hard, and out pops a leg this big, which you put down on the table. Um, reach in again, grasp and pull hard. Out comes an arm about the same length. And then use this instrument again and again to tear out the spine, the intestines, the heart and lungs. Head on a baby that size is about the size of a plum. And again, you can't see it but you're pretty sure you got it if your instrument's around something, your fingers are spread as far as they will go. You know you did it right if you crush down the instrument and white material runs out of the cervix. That was the baby's brains. And you can pull out skull pieces. Sometimes a little face comes back and stares back at you. What, what has been the reaction that you have experienced when you share with people or people have discovered that you are both abortion survivors? Most of the time people, I mean, similar to my response to my birth mother, people have no idea that a baby can survive an abortion. I mean, it's unfathomable that a procedure that was meant to end someone's life could accidentally not end it. But I think it also has humanized the unborn baby, the aborted baby for a lot of people because, um, 
you know, when you when you look at my face, the fact that I was a twin, you're actually looking at my twin. Mm -hmm. And so people can see that humanity of the unborn baby, the aborted baby through my existence, through my humanity. And so I think it helps people empathize with that child because so, so often it's hard to understand or care about something that you haven't been affected by or that you can't physically see. And so for somebody to be able to see that human being, that aborted baby, it, it's helpful. And then I think also as I share the same experience as, as Josiah of finding out I survived my birth mother's abortion and choosing to forgive my birth mother and choosing to forgive my uh, birth mother's mother who took her to have this abortion at 13 years old, actually, and choosing to forgive whoever else was involved, including the abortionist. But I think it helps people empathize with the woman like my birth mother who said, you know, if I had known that I could do it if I had known I was strong enough and capable and that there were resources available for me, then I would have known that I could be a mother. I would have felt strong enough to do it and I would have done that. And that's what she said that she needed in her moment of desperation and uncertainty. And so I think it's helped people just really empathize with the baby mm -hmm. and with the woman and with the family. And I'm grateful for that. Yeah, I would say usually, uh, <clears throat> Always the first response seems to always be shock. Um, and then there's usually three different responses I see. So whether I'm uh, sharing with somebody in a conversation or whether or not I'm, I'm speaking at an event or something like that, and I'm sharing with a group of people, uh, there's that initial look of shock usually on their face. And then it's usually followed either by either comments or looks on their face of, of disbelief. Like, ah, that's not true. That doesn't happen. There's no way that something's got to be wrong there. Something's got to be off there, right? Or uh, I'll see um, a lot of times, especially if I'm sharing with the group, I'll see uh, people automatically burst into tears. Mm -hmm. They don't they don't know even how to handle it, how to process it. Often uh, there's also a look of, of guilt I'll, I'll see in in a lot of people's eyes. Um, I, I share this a lot. Most of the time when I go speak and share my story with the group. I can't think of a time when I've done it and I haven't had somebody come up to me afterwards who either had an abortion or helped somebody else get an abortion. Um, and, and, and there's just guilt. You can see that they've been caring, some for decades. Um, and, and so those are usually the three responses I see though, just shock and disbelief or just, I mean, just horror at it, just um, tears or, or, or guilt. How do each of you, starting with you, Dr. Robinson, how do you feel when you hear yeah. Claire and Josiah tell their stories? Well, of course, now remorse. And then as I listen to Dr. Lamentino describe that procedure, it kind of marvels me that we, some people refer to that as reproductive freedom and that this is a, 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 a pro-choice issue. You know, pro-choice is such a lie. You know, babies never choose to die. Uh, President Reagan had a, a famous quote, he said he's always noticed that people who are in favor of abortion are all alive. <laughs> but when I hear stories like Josiah's, and you're the, this is the first time I've heard yours, uh, it just amazes me that what a human being is capable of. And we've shared what we're capable of, and you guys are the witness to what we do to human beings. It's an absolute miracle that you have survived right. and you have survived with a testimony of life. And, and again, I don't know you, Josiah, but Claire and I uh, go back. We're both from the free state of Texas <laughs> where I have had the opportunity to see her work, but also to hear her speak uh, at a, a benefit for a uh, pregnancy of a Christian prenatal clinic and to hear your story and you have such a powerful testimony and and the way your eyes and I we always talk about eyes being a window to the soul your eyes help tell your verbal story so well and when I heard for the first time you tell that story in person and I listened and it and humanized it and personalized it to hear how uh, you know, your mother, as a young teenager, was literally assaulted and had the contents of her uterus uh, robbed from her. 
and then to know that you survived and then for that young teenager to be taken back mm -hmm. to be attempted to get you a second time, how can two miracles happen? It's absolutely astounding. So you have a twin that I don't know if you ever had dreams about, but I, yeah. you know, I know as a twin myself that our life together is just absolutely amazing. So what happened at the end of when you spoke, I just felt led by the Lord to go up and wrap my arms around you and just ask forgiveness on the part of colleagues like I have here and said, you know, forgive us what we've done to your twin and all the other millions of, of, of children. And in the midst of me doing that and having a loss for words, a very astute uh, Southern Baptist <laughs> pastor in the audience who was someone like the chaplain for that benefit, rushed up to the podium where I was there with you and he just said, we're gonna stop this benefit and we're just gonna pray. And the presence of the Holy Spirit was there for healing and tears. And it was just an awesome encounter. But what that told me was that there's such a tremendous need for healing, reconciliation and forgiveness for just uh, an amazing amount of, of loss and damage that we've done. But the other thing was just the postscript on it. You were a twin, I was a twin, and the pastor that came up as a chaplain was a twin, three sets of twins all being ministered to at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I just want to encourage you, keep telling that story. It's a testimony that makes such a difference in people's lives. Thank you. Thank you for telling your stories. Um, there is a lot of guilt that follows when you walk away from the abortion industry. My daughter Heather died, and that's why I ultimately stopped doing abortions. And my brother Mark was my best friend in the world, and he died of cancer about 12 years ago. And I've always believed, want to believe, that when my time comes, Heather and Mark will be standing there. Mm -hmm. But it scares me to death. That maybe those 1,200 kids are going to be there too. So thank you for what you're doing. You two prove more than any, anything else that everyone has a purpose in life. You have a purpose. What are the odds that you would even be sitting here and yet you are? Thank you. Thank you. It's always hard. <laughs> being with abortion survivors because I feel I was the victimizer. And yet I have gotten nothing but love and forgiveness from every abortion survivor that I've met. And I'm, I am so thankful. And I'm, I'm just thankful that you, you're willing to get out there and share your stories. And it makes a difference. I, and we all have work that we're still doing. Mm -hmm. it, it, it never, it never stops until the day we die. I shared that, you know, how I bullied my girlfriend into getting an abortion and that child, my first child would be about 50, 51 years old. I've never really, to this date, sat down with my children and said, you know, you have, they know I forced a girlfriend to have an abortion, but they don't know, they've never sat before me and I said, you know, you would have had an older brother who'd be 51 right now. Hmm. And you'd have, you know, nieces, nephews, and uh, you won't meet that, those people till later. We recognize anyone who's ever seen a family tree. I coined a phrase that abortion kills trees, hmm. family trees. If you write out <clears throat> your basic uh, family tree, and abort just any square or circle that's two or three generations up and see the what the tree looks like before the abortion and what the tree looks like after you cut it out. It's it's pruned, it's cut down. It's kinda like that commercial we used to see back in the in the seventies. Your brain where they show the eggs and then they show the eggs right, your your brain on drugs. And we have killed the uh, or we at least trimmed and mutilated the family tree of our planet immensely over the, over the, uh, over the decades. 
It's so common for people not to realize that until you illustrate it in some way. Yeah. Um, I'm remembering in a time many years ago, my wife and I were speaking in a high school. We didn't get too many opportunities to do that. It was an, actually an assembly. And we asked them to rope off one third of the seats. Now kids have their normal seats. Mm -hmm. When they walk into the auditorium, and one third of the auditorium's been roped off. They can't sit in their normal seats. Mm -hmm. And we tell them, look at those seats. Those are your classmates that did not make it. People don't realize the effect that abortion has on women, but it, I felt worse about killing my own child than I did about killing everybody else's. Mm -hmm. Both I felt horrible about, but killing my own child was worse. I had more remorse over that, struggled with that more than anything else. So uh, this experience is kind of uh, surreal for me. Um, I've actually never, uh, been able to have conversation with uh, abortion doctors. Uh, they don't really like to talk to me for some reason. Um, of course, I've read testimonies of post-abortive doctors. Um, you know, I've seen videos and, and things like that. But would, would you mind sharing with me just like, when you were um, an abortion doctor, like, like, like what caused you to be okay with with doing those procedures, doing the abortions? For me, it was, I, I thought that was the best way I could help women. And I'm sure that was colored by the fact mm -hmm. that I had had an abortion. And I don't know if there was some justification there, but for me, it really wasn't the money, although the money was nice. Mm -hmm. um, but it was mainly, I wanted to help women. I didn't want anybody to have to go through a pregnancy that they didn't want. I was absolutely dedicated pro-choice when I graduated from medical school. Uh, and as I've said before, when a gynecologist says they're pro-choice, it's not just some vague political position. You have to decide whether you're going to actually do the abortions or not. Mm -hmm. And I thoroughly and utterly was convinced that I was doing the right thing for my patients um, in providing them with abortions. People often ask, I mean, well, you're a doctor, don't you know these are human beings? Okay. And the answer is yes. I will only speak for myself. I, will, I cannot speak for any other abortionist. I didn't care. I just didn't care until years later. And I, I think we got to recognize it's not just the doctors. I tell people, you know, if you have a friend and you drive your friend to go get an abortion, mm -hmm. You're part of that abortion. You're an accessory yeah. to that crime. The way I got introduced to abortion, as I mentioned earlier, was I thought it as an instrument to make my lifestyle easier and to get rid of something that was going to be a problem. But abortion is something that's in your mind. And as you, you as a pastor, you know that when we come to know the Lord, we are transformed by the renewing of our mind. So abortion is something that we have in our hearts as uh, as a non-believer, as someone that's living in, in darkness. And I, we just need to recognize that if you don't know the Lord, uh, that you are actually capable of anything. And a liar is a murderer and vice versa. So you just have to recognize that uh, you have to come to know the Lord to be set free mm -hmm. from the bondage of this whole uh, Fetophobic, anti humanite mindset that is against God because the human being is the height of God's creation made in his image. And so we are the enemy of God's enemy. And he's going to do anything to, to steal, kill, or destroy those made in his image. So our only hope is in the Lord, our only hope is to redeem, be redeemed so that we can now be on the side of truth and on the side of light. Because it doesn't cut, I knew academically and embryologically that a human being development starts when the egg and the sperm uh, come together, but so what? How about some money for an abortion? You see, the evil has a way of controlling what you do and who you are when you don't know the Lord. I think we are all so deceived, you know, basically deceived. And as physicians and medical students, you're taught 
taught to compartmentalize. You have to do so many things that are painful. You see death all the time, and you just put it in different little boxes, and you're very schizophrenic in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think you're right. When you um, don't know the Lord, now I grew up as a Methodist preacher's kid, but by the mm -hmm. time I got to college, I was an atheist, and I think that was just the open doorway and I truly believed I was doing something good. I thought I was a good person. We can be so deceived. I just, as I was hearing each of you share, you know, what you've been involved in and um, even just how God has, has turned your life out around and redeemed that. I, first of all, I just wanna thank y'all for being here and being willing to sit with me and Josiah. I know that that is not something that is easy. Um, we're probably not easy to look at and recognize as, you know, human beings similar to the ones that you uh, took the lives of. So I appreciate that. Something people have have said to me so often is, Claire, God has turned ashes into beauty through your life. And that's true. I mean, both Josiah sit here and we are evident of that. But the same is true for y'all. And um, I was raised, you know, in a Christian home and taught about God's forgiveness. And so it was easy for me to forgive my birth mother. And I can say that um, it's easy for me today to recognize that the same is true for each of you, that God has turned something that was meant for evil into something that is good. I often use, Dr. Levitino, your videos when I'm talking to students, your um, videos that you made describing different types of abortion procedures, as well as um, your experience working at the uh, clinic for women who have complicated pregnancies and saying that there has never been a reason that an abortion needed to be performed. Possibly we need to deliver the baby to save the woman's life, but an abortion killing the baby is not necessary. And so all that to say, I am just so grateful that y'all have allowed God to use your experience and that there is good coming out of that because I have seen, um, yes, I can share my story and people are able to see the humanity of the baby and empathize with the woman who's had an abortion. And then I can share some an experience like yours and they're able to hear truly what is going on inside of abortion facilities. And that is how God is using um, what you've done, your regret. Uh, he's using that for good and it's opening the eyes of people to the truth. And so I'm, I'm so incredibly grateful that you are sharing your story and your regret as hard as it might be. Thank you. Josiah, is there anything else that you would want to say to any of the uh, doctors here? Like I, I have my own personal questions, I think even just kind of in my life. Um, you know, I mentioned before finding out about my abortion story and, and how we've speculated, just not sure what all's happened. And, um, and I just from your, in a sense, professional opinion, I guess, like, does that seem like something that would be very true in the sense of my birth mother having that type of an abortion? Um, is the fact that maybe I have a deformed arm, do you think that's a likely cause of the abortion? Do you think that it's very likely that I would have a twin or what else would have made the doctor think it's a complete procedure? Not every abortionist is ethical. Or um, thorough. Or thorough. And um, they may not have looked at all the tissue. They may have seen a, a piece of limb and that, uh, good enough. You know, or they may just not have looked at the tissue at all. So it could have been that they removed a twin and didn't realize you were there. Or it could have been that they just were sloppy and just didn't really examine the tissue. Mm -hmm. But I think your arm could have been a result of the abortion. Some of the tissue was stripped away and then the body healed. Right. Yeah, what's up? It could have been a, a, a twin possibly and again, not, not all abortionists are thorough. Isn't it amazing, though, uh, a real good abortion where you always kill the baby? It's the only procedure in medicine where right. death is the, is the goal. But anyway, uh, early, uh, a human being, uh, an embryo, has different regenerative potential than full -grown. In other words, you can take a larger part of a limb off and it actually regenerate either fully or partially. So it may have happened 
as a, you may have had your whole arm off and your body did the best it could to bring at least part of it, uh, part of it back, but there's no way yeah. uh, to really know. Yeah. But you know, the, the way you are and who you are uh, is, uh, I know in some ways I think such a, a gift that sends the message to others that it's not about the arm, it's not about uh, 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 any physical part, it's a spiritual part. We, we in our family had a, an individual that was going, they were going to abort their child simply because mm -hmm. the mother had chicken pox. There was nothing known to be wrong with the baby. And uh, we were successful in convincing this woman to go through her pregnancy. And the baby came out ab absolutely normal. Yep. And the only thing that was wrong with the baby, it was missing just the distal part of the baby finger on one hand. And that sent, I think, the message to me and, uh, and the message to others and that you sent others that, you know, every individual, every human being is unique and important, but somehow we've dehumanized pre-borns, uh, anyone, you know, if you found to have an extra chromosome, the medicine now bullies families and, uh -huh. and mothers into getting abortion just because their baby's not gonna quote unquote live up to our expectations and, and, and what we think is normal. And that's absolutely wrong. It's the worst part of prejudice, being prejudiced and wanting to kill a little preborn child simply because it doesn't measure up. So, that's kind of the way I, See. Yeah, well, and so much of my my story, my struggle is tied up uh, with my deformed arm. And um, before knowing about my birth mother's abortion, it was um, self-worth image, self-worth issues, self-image issues, thinking I was of no value because of my deformity, thinking I was less than others because of my deformity. After I found out about my birth mother's abortion, a lot of it was then tied into anger towards them, blaming the fact that I had the deformity because of their decisions. And then also um, a lot of more self-worth and self-image issues because uh, these people who I believe loved me, should have loved me the most, they tried to take my life. And, and the beautiful thing, the redemptive thing uh, about the gospel is, you know, the gospel's not about our worthiness. It's not about our capability. It's not about um, what we think we'll accomplish, who we think we are, what kind of value we have. It's about the value that our creator assigns to us. And, and as the, that gospel changed my life, I found redemption through that, but it's also the heart of even what we're talking about right now, right? That that the unborn, every human life is valued, not because of what we think they'll accomplish, not because of their physical abilities or mental capabilities or, or what socioeconomic status they'll even be born into, their value is rooted in their creator who's created them in his image and, and who assigns value on their life mm -hmm. and, and has proven that value time and time again, ultimately through sending Jesus for us, right? Um, and so uh, I appreciate, I, I really do appreciate that, that perspective. I, I have to share what, uh, one thing God had me do just a couple years ago was assign a name. He gave me, I, I took this pad of paper and just started naming each baby that I aborted. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure why or, you know, what, it, what all it had to do with spiritually, but, um, I had to just name each one, each as I thought of each one, I named them, and that seemed to bring healing. And that's the that's part of the rehumanization mm -hmm. process. Uh, I, I went through that with a with a well-known I don't know if you know Dr. Nay in, in, in Canada, where you he you, he works with former abortion providers and those that have been involved with the industry and the abortion cartel, where. It's, it, you know, we can come to the Lord, but there is a process. There is a, a working out of your salvation or a sanctification process that you have to recognize you've been damaged. You have been that same dehumanization that you projected on that child. It's part of you. I was dehumanized. You were dehumanized. And here we are dehumanizing the baby. And it takes 
a, a, a process, you have to go back and, and, and yes, name the child. That child had a name, that child had a vocation that it was going to, that child was going to have children, that child had a future, and you <laughs> took it away and you got to own up to that responsibility. Yeah. And when you start to do that, you start to recognize the capability of what a human being can do and the wickedness that mm. we can have within us, even though we look so good on the <laughs> outside or be so wicked and evil on the inside. Dr. Levitino, do you agree with um, Dr. Robbins and Dr. Altman? They had their kind of provided their opinion on Josiah's injury. What's your opinion on Josiah's injury? Anything we say about Josiah's injury is totally speculative. We have no idea what actually <laughs> happened. My guess is there probably was a twin. I mean, in that, that would be the most likely situation to fool the abortionist, but it's speculation. Mm -hmm. My guess is that your injury is more likely than not, not due to the abortion, mm -hmm. because that would have disrupted the gestational sac that you were floating in. Mm -hmm. And if that had happened, you, more like, you most likely would have miscarried at some point. Mm -hmm. So if I guess at probabilities, I would guess more that you more likely, now I'm getting more technical, but mm -hmm. had what's called an amniotic band during the pregnancy that constricted blood flow to your arm. Mm -hmm. But that's, you know, that's all just speculation, as I said. There's nothing more you can say. We talk a lot about Jesus and religion, and we're all Christians at this table. Um, I'm very careful when I, when I speak to be very aware that an audience is not, many people listening are not going to be Christians, including listening to this program. If I'm in a religious group, then I'm perfectly willing to talk about the religious if I'm in a Christian group, specifically as I am a Christian, I am willing to share those Christian principles mm -hmm. with other people who, who believe the same thing. Mm -hmm. So I speak only to the Christians who are listening. Mm -hmm. The central tenet, the most basic tenet of the Christian faith is that God sent his son Jesus to earth to, to save us, to take our sins on him. Mm -hmm. And what he basically said was, I will die so you can live. Mm -hmm. Abortion... And I'm talking only to the Christians, turns that on its head. Mm -hmm. You must die so I can live. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a, that's a good point. Now, I would say this to those that aren't Christians. Let's say, for instance, you, you're Jewish and you happen to have a Christian family. And I've, I've, I've heard this shared by, with one of my Christian colleagues. And the family wanted this this newborn who was not going to survive except for a very short period of time, wanted this newborn to be baptized. But him as a Jew doing a Christian baptism, but wow, that's pretty foreign. But you know what he recognized? He recognized that he was a servant first to that family, first to that baby. And he talked about how he as a Jew did a Christian baptism on this baby because the family didn't care if this doctor who was baptizing the baby was Jewish or not, they just wanted the baby baptized because there was no pastor, there was no, no clergy around to do that. So what we've got to recognize, and I think we all do that, we're servants, sometimes we're called out of our comfort zone. Uh, we've got to take care of all human beings, regardless of if they're Christian or mm -hmm. you know, whether they are Muslim or Jewish mm -hmm. or atheist or agnostic in that you know, God's unconditional love, which he's shown us the highest level of, is also available to them. But they have to see it through us and our personal testimonies. Do it. And I think that's an, uh, there's an important point that you don't have to be Christian to be pro-life. Right. There are many, many people who are, are pro-life. And because it's not just a Christian issue, sure. it's a moral issue. Mm -hmm. Do any of you have any questions for Josiah or for Claire? No, I think you've both expressed yourselves very well. And thank you for, even though we weren't involved in your abortions, thank you for your forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have a question, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, I, like Josiah, had physical complications when um, 
I was born. I was born with a dislocated hip and club feet. They actually ripped my birth mother's amniotic sac during the abortion that successfully aborted my twin. She was told that um, that was caused by her abortion, but we don't know for certain as, as Josiah's situation. But my question is, did you have any experience with a baby surviving an abortion or did you know any of your colleagues that did? I never had a baby survive one of my abortions. I was very thorough. Mm -hmm. um, in the hospital where I worked as a resident, when I was a resident, we weren't doing d &Es at that point. They hadn't been developed yet. We were doing saline abortions, and these women would have to go through labor. And somewhere at home, I've got a picture of a very tiny 20-some-weeker that had been a subject of a saline abortion, um, who survived the abortion miraculously. Um, and in, in, in a fit of almost black humor, the nurses named her Selena. And there's a picture of um, one of the nurses sliding her wedding ring over the baby's arm very easily. That's how small that baby was, but she survived. And my understanding is that type of abortion is no longer performed because too many were being born alive. It's a, and, it's a problem. It was one of the many problems with that procedure. It was possible to have a live birth. There are others, but it's technical. We won't get into it. The problem is that now um, with the abortion pill and with, um, with uh, in, induction abortions, you know, so we were going to we we're going to have more abortion survivors. What happens during a saline abortion, Dr. Levitino? What was done back then for a saline abortion is um, if, if, as I said, suction DNCs are being done up to about 13 weeks. If they came to our clinic and they were more than 13 weeks, we'd make them wait three or four weeks until they were about 16 or 17 weeks to do the saline procedure. And um, what we do is did an amniocentesis, put a needle into the sac, draw as much of the amniotic fluid out as we could, and we substitute 20% salt solution. This is part of the reason why the procedure was as dangerous as it was, because if you got 20%, if, if by chance you got 20% salt solution into her circulation, the mom's circulation, she'd end up seizing and could be in very bad shape. Um, the patients would, the salt solution would burn the babies, basically, basically burn them to death. Um, and that releases prostaglandins, which initiated labor that ultimately ended up in their delivery. Uh, I saw saline patients have to labor anywhere from 8 to 36 hours uh, before they delivered their usually dead children. When an abortionist um, has a baby that survives an abortion, what is common procedure today? <laughs> well, the procedure should be legally, and this is part of what I teach the medical students, is, you know, most people don't understand, they go, oh, we want Roe versus Wade back. They have no idea what Roe versus Wade even says, other than basically any abortion, any time for any reason. And it's a long, complicated thing to explain why that is, but it is. Mm -hmm. um, the, the reason you can get away with it, I'm a lawyer as well. In the world of law, there are only two things in the entire universe, persons and property. So a human being, and I asked the question in class, you know, what is the difference, if any, between a human being and a person? And most people, well, there is no difference. Oh, yes, there is. A human being, you are a human being by virtue, by scientific definition. You are a person under law. That's a whole different thing. Um, so that distinction is, is, is one that most people just don't understand. Um, and that's the point of abortion is okay as long as the baby is dead before you do the abortion. That's why, and Dr. Altman talked about induction abortions, and these are done after 24 weeks. How about the late ones, basically all the way to term? Um, if you're, again, if done correctly, you have to kill the child first, then induce labor, why it's called an induction abortion. Um, if, you, if you don't and that child is born alive, the moment that child's born alive, that is a person under the law and has rights. And you need, to, and you legally need to take care of that child. But Dr. that isn't what was happening. But, but, well, in, in many cases, that's the case. I mean, I can't, I can't speak for everyone. Uh, but Dr. Gosnell was ignoring that and he's spending the rest of his life in prison where he belongs. I saw <clears throat> the resident was trying to get the needle into the amniotic sac, and that's done under ultrasound because you want to make sure that needle 
get into the sack. And I saw them do multiple stick attempts trying to get that needle in the sack. And they never did. But because I was in a residency, I didn't get to see the continuity of what they were going to try to do to continue to try to kill this baby. It may have been they were not successful and that baby may have survived. I really don't know. But what happens in some, I've known of a couple of cases where uh, a baby who may have been still somewhat alive, but very, very seriously injured, and the babies are kind of wrapped up and put over in a corner and not given any resuscitation or life support. I've heard situations where some nurse says they're gonna do something and they rush the baby over to the neonatal intensive care unit. Most of the times the baby does not survive, but it's because it's such a, I hate to call it a gray area, but it's, it's one of those places where the baby is supposed to be killed. Mm -hmm. And if we just wait a few minutes, it's gonna happen. And then those few minutes turn into more minutes and then now what are we going to do? So it's happened both both ways, but I guess we all heard of that pediatric neurologist uh, governor of uh, Virginia, Virginia at the time described what should happen if the baby comes out alive. And it was just horrendous to hear him describe how you're going to watch a baby who really needs medical care, gasping and trying to trying to live, we're going to ignore that's why we're going to counsel with the parents whether we're going to do anything about it. It's a horrific... We'll make a decision uh, then. Yeah, yeah, we'll make our decision. I think those were his words. Yeah. That's this, you know, uh, we're, we're getting a little more afield here. I don't know how far in the weeds we want to get, but this is also really bears heavily on this. We need late term abortion to save women's lives. Rubbish. Um, at this stage, medical knowledge has progressed to the point where children are viable at around 22 to 23 weeks. I worked for almost 10 years in a tertiary level university hospital in New York where all of the high risk pregnancies came. Cancer cases, decompensating heart, you know, heart problems, uh, severe preeclampsia, it could go on and on and on. I, and, and as a pro-life physician, I worked in that facility for almost 10 years. I saved hundreds of women's lives. I terminated, ended, hundreds of pregnancies to save people's lives. But I didn't deliberately kill, and I did not have to deliberately kill a single child to do that. Vast, 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 vast number of these cases occur after fetal liability. And there's two problems with late-term abortion to, quote, save women's lives. The smart thing you do is deliver her. Get a delivery going, even if it's early. Did all those kids live? No. But they all had a shot. They all had a chance. And most of them did survive. And an, a late-term abortion takes anywhere from four to seven days to accomplish. If you have a real medical emergency... You don't have four to seven days to work the problem out. Desire, Claire, are there any other questions you have for the former abortionist here? So I find it really interesting. Um, you've you've talked, you know, just how far uh, medicines progressed. You've mentioned um, the abortion pill, things like that. And if we kind of look back through the history of like abortion, like here in the states, we talk about Roe versus Wade, all those things like. Out the gate, a lot of those arguments was it's a clump of cells. Let's let's dehumanize, right? And and it's creating the separation um, between between the unborn and us to make it more palatable that we're taking their lives. And it's been so interesting to see as medicine has progressed, just more and more and more. It's more and more difficult to dehumanize. I think, and, and I think about it from the perspective of at the time we're taping this. I just I had a I have a 13 month old baby at home. And so I remember the last couple of years as my wife went through her pregnancy, I mean, I wanted to go to, to all of her appointments because I'd be like, do we get to see the baby today? And she told me that's not like we don't see them every time. Right. But I remember all the ultrasounds. I remember the 3D. I mean, my child's 13 months and we've still got pictures of her ultrasound on our refrigerator just because it's so m remarkable. I remember sitting in rooms where they'd have to do these uh, stress tests on her and they would just hook up these things and we just listen to my daughter's heartbeat. 
for 45 minutes. A day. All these progressions in medicine that, that humanize the unborn so much more today than before. But we also have the development of something that helps us dehumanize them in a way like never before with the abortion pill, right? Because before it was, hey, you can go to the doctor, they can get this taken care of, it's just a clump of cells, don't worry about it, whatever, whatever. But now we have all this modern technology, we see the unborn in the womb, we see their faces, we see their development, we hear their heartbeat, all these different things. But now somebody just has to order some pills. They take it at home and it can take, and it can take care of that problem for them. And I, I would just ask you as, as a previous abortion providers who, who went through that process of dehumanizing to perform those procedures. Now those procedures are literally in the hands of the people through these pills, like, do you have anything you would say to them in attempts to rehumanize or, or that they should be considering, really thinking about in that? Quickly, um, when someone came to me struggling with the decision of whether to have an abortion or not, we use the term embryo, we use the term fetus. Mm -hmm. Those are scientific terms, but they're also used to dehumanize. Um, I would remind them of the, and I would always speak about their child in the term that is always correct at every age of gestation. That is your son or daughter. Mm -hmm. And I always have to wince a little when somebody tells me, well, women don't take abortion lightly. This is, this is really difficult. It's a terrible thing. Oh, why is it a terrible thing? The thing I worry about now with the abortion pill is the woman herself becomes the abortionist. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I just feel like it piles the guilt on later when they finally realize what they have done. And at some point, women understand and realize what they have done. Mm -hmm. that's, what, that's what scares me. But it, it also just goes back to, yes, we have ultrasounds, we can see the baby, but we are so deceived as a society. We have become so deceived that we block it out. You know, I call it simply what it is, the kill pill. Mm -hmm. And what is done is taking a woman who at least had maybe an assistant in the room and a, an abortionist in the room, some people around, someone to be in the recovery room. And now, with the kill pill, this woman is home with no other human being except her, herself, passes another human being possibly in the toilet doesn't know what to do. So I just hear the sound of such loneliness, despair, and that is just, uh, uh, I can't even imagine what it's like for her to be in pain and bleeding and all alone with a lost child.